Bill Mazeroski, and you have like 11 other um, public pieces in, in Pittsburgh and Baseball Hall of Fame. And although you're not like just super into sports, but right. you do this stuff. <laughs> I know. People it's ask you about the team cast. all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm typecast. Yeah. Typecast as because you're known, you know, a lot for for that work. Yeah. But you do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I was um, born and raised here, and uh, I worked my way through the University of Pittsburgh, and I studied painting and anthropology. And I like that. I'm self-taught sculptor also. Um, I just kind of fell into that, and uh, because I was, I graduated when the steel mill shut down here in the city, and you couldn't find a job at McDonald's. And I had just gotten married, and uh, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't go to graduate school. I was going to go to Carnegie Mellon as, and to become a professor, but instead I got married. So um, what happened was I was looking everywhere for a job. I ended up being a waitress, kept going on interviews uh, to be a graphic artist, and finally, I, you know, I did one sculpture and I had a slide of that and somebody said, you know, um, you're a really good sculptor. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, well, where can I get a job? And he said, well, call this guy. So um, I did and I said, and he said, how much do you, do you know how to do a bar relief? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've never done it before. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> can, you, can you tell people what that is? A bar relief? A bar, you, does everybody know what a bar relief is? No. Yeah. It's, it's a flat portrait, like on the side of a coin. Uh -huh. Only, only it's bigger, and you see it um, like, uh, on a corporate wall or in a hospital dedication. It's kind of like on a wall. It's yeah, three it's dimensionally a, comes out. Right, it's it's three three dimension flat. That's all I can explain it. And um, so I did that as at the same time I was a waitress, <laughs> and uh, you know it took me a week, and I was really worried that you know it took so long, and I turned it in after a weekend, and the guy said, "This is." This is great. How did you do it so fast? Huh? And I said, well, you know, I don't know. And I said, do you have any more? And he said, yeah. So I kept asking for more and more, and that's what happened. I ended up owning my own business, and I sculpted and, um, my own sculpture business for 30 years now. And then I sculpted for the, uh, uh, Fenton Glass. I did every everything anybody said. Can you sculpt this? I'd say yes. <laughs> I would never say no. I still, it's still not my fault. I never say no, ever. Um, so I recently got back to painting. I brought one of my paintings in. And um, I'm working on some small commissions, and a large commission is pending. Can I ask and, you about that one? Yes, please. Okay. The city of uh, Newark is yeah. interested in having you uh, do a Roberto Clemente for the city of Newark yes. now in the, yeah. in the park there. Mm -hmm. And you had said that um, you wanted to capture aspects of Clemente's, like humanitarian. Right. And you might implement some of that in this. Yeah, piece but um, a lot of people, uh, like I said, I was typecast. And uh, the reason I, I ended up sculpting Roberto Clemente is, you know, is because, I mean, I enjoy a baseball game, but that when I was in college, one of the ways I was able to work my way through college was I used to draw pictures for the school newspaper, draw portraits. And one day somebody handed me a portrait of Roberto Clemente. And I had no clue who when he was. When you were in school? When I was in college oh. at Pitt. No <clears throat> idea who he was. And I thought, wow, you know, this man is just so handsome. And I, uh, that, there was something about him. And uh, I read the article. He had passed away. He died on a humanitarian mission um, delivering medical supplies to Nicaragua. And I thought, there's something special about this man. And I think I fell in love with him that moment. So um, I was freelancing, doing, working for Fenton Glass, still working for all these different companies. In Ohio, in West Virginia, um, somebody said, the Pirates are going to do a statue of Roberto uh, How many years after you had that experience in college was that? I think that was about 10. 10 years later? 10 years later. And I got chills. I said, I have to do this. Okay, I have to do this. Uh, but there's going to be a competition, you know. So I, my heart sunk. I thought, well, I can't. I'll never win this, you know. <laughs> you know, I heard that. You know, there were or there were artists from New York, from Puerto Rico, everywhere. But I just loved the man so much. You know, I, I wanted to sculpt him. So uh, I entered my idea anyhow. 
you know, I thought, what have I got to lose? And uh, I got a phone call from the pirates, and they said, Susan, uh, do you want good, the good news or bad news? Which one do you want first? And I said, well, give me, give me the uh, uh, bad news first. He said, well, you're going to be really busy <laughs> this summer. I said, why? You know, he says, well, you won. So I screamed, and that's how it happened. So now everybody, um, I, I do baseball players. <laughs> but what I do when I sculpt is I, I, I do a lot of research about the man, the human being inside of that uniform. And, and I do a lot, a lot of research. I mean, I did Jackie Robinson for Jersey City. And I, 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 everybody knows his story, but I read so much about him, I became depressed, you know, what he went through. And uh, I, I just put all of that, I put as much feeling into my sculptures as possible. You know, I, I don't go to games and, and watch how they play. You know, I, I, I read about the man. I, I put their, I try to put their soul into my sculpture. And uh, um, It's almost like they're so, having a dialogue with you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to interrupt, but yeah. you, you've done more of the, you won the Gene Kelly. I did. I don't know if they ever, ever I did. Oh, you did the, I, you're going to do the Gene Kelly. I, I, I won know. the competition. Oh, yeah. She, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was one of the members on the panel when she won the competition to Gene, to Gene Kelly. But if they, because you can talk a great deal about that, but. Uh, it's a whole other thing with the yeah, pirates. Yeah, so, but it's not a pirate. Although he did a movie called The Pirate. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Well, well, that, that got squashed, and, and the, the reason that that um, it was all all a go. His this, wife wanted his to do wife something. just changed her mind. He yeah. said, "Oh no!" And this this is what happens with competitions, and this is you know our our work is really really uh, you know we never know from one day to the next what's going to happen. You know, there could be um, like this this new commission that's pending. Um, I sent in a contract for New York, New Jersey, and I didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And finally, I got a phone call yesterday. And, and this is how up in the air it is. You know, we, we never know where our next paying job is going to come yeah. from. And so it's really difficult to, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not an easy way to make a living. It's, it's not. We're not doing our hobby, you know, and having a grand old time. We're working really hard with, from because we're coming from a place where we're driven to do this. It's like you, you, have, you have to we do have it. We have to. I'm not happy if I'm not doing it. I, I could have been an anthropologist. You know, I, I had a double major in, in the University of Pittsburgh. and But I had to do art. <clears throat> there was no, no other way I could go. I wouldn't be happy. Um, so... I want to ask you a little later about if you're still friends with Clemente's yeah. family. Like, mm -hmm. they really feel you're a part of and what you've done with them. But I want to get to James just for a minute. <clears throat> um, James has um, the big figure. You saw them here on, like, Liberty Avenue, and also inspired by music. He's got uh, Baby Kong, and uh, he just did um, the St. Michael for the fallen officers. And um, can you... Talk about working large. I know you work a lot with like Braddock and the mayor there, and how he's revitalizing. And um, when you do these large pieces, what's the impact that you've seen on the communities when you put them there? Um, well, well, I'll give you a little bit of background first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, um, I went to Peabody High School, and and that's where I was introduced to. Um, to um, sculpture through through um, there was an artist of history, um, Ed Kostowitz was his name, and um, I thought he was a really fantastic artist. Although in high school I didn't really know he was an artist because usually you don't know that your teachers are artists necessarily. I, I, and 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 he was one of these these teachers that inspired a lot of students to become professional artists. And pretty much a lot of people that went through his classes. Very, got very interested in art, and I was one of those people. So he got me started in clay, and that's where it all started. And um, and then I spent. I'm also um, self self taught. Never, never. I think Peabody traumatized me enough. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the, the men having to swim naked. <laughs> that's another story. That's, that's another story. You know, you had to swim naked in public high school in Pittsburgh as a guy. Anyway, um, 
I, I after high school I left Pittsburgh um, and um, I went on a maybe a 10 15 year um, mad traveling spree where I hitchhiked and traveled all over the world just out of pure desire to see everything that was going on in the world just got odd jobs here and there and then um, um, my formal education was actually um, I apprenticed with a with a master musical instrument maker in England who I met in my travels and I apprenticed to, to learn how to make violins and and other types of um, Renaissance musical instruments and I became a, a professional violin maker for many years and, <coughs> and that's where I developed a lot of my, 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 my technical skills and other types of skills too and then um, then I returned to sculpture. I had a desire to return to sculpture after making violins for many years. I felt like I needed, I had more imagination in the violin making world to offer. So I started to work with clay again, and then um, um, I, 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 all of a sudden I'm making big sculptures. So, so then I, I came back to Pittsburgh about 12 years ago. Was that in Oregon you were doing, or where was? It? In, in, I lived in many places. Um, I lived in Mexico for several years, and I lived in Brazil for several years, very influenced by Mexican painters, um, very influenced by um, uh, all the, the old Mexican sculpture, the old pre-Columbian sculpture that you see in, in Central America, in Mexico, Mayan, and, and, and the Aztec, and all the fantastic, and they're big, you know, the, I, I, I was very excited when you see these big things that they carved. And they're also very tied to the, to the cultures of the, of the places that, that they came from. Um, and, then, um, um, and then I returned to Pittsburgh to help out my parents because they got old. And that's why I'm back here now. And, and in Pittsburgh, I started to, um, I really developed um, ways to make large scale public art for outside. So I, instead of making, working with clay, I figured out how I could turn my clay into concrete. Um, well, similar to, to, to like Susan with bronze, where you make you make them out of clay, and then you make molds and then you cast. But instead of casting in bronze, I cast them in concrete. Partly because it's a little more affordable than bronze, and also because I like I like the look because it looks like like stone. So like the the big musicians in downtown are concrete, but originally they were made in clay. So, so it's kind of the same thing you learn in Mexico, like how the large art impacted the culture, and you're kind of doing that here in terms of the community, like bringing these big pieces in and revitalizing or engaging them in that. Yeah, and then, and then as, I, as I became more, I mean, I got involved in public art because I felt like the public liked my art. That, that's pretty much why. I never was a big, big, I never had a, a big attraction to galleries. It always seemed kind of too close to me. For, for me, it felt more natural for my stuff to be out in the public. And when I did things in Brazil, you know, the people in the art galleries, uh, who knows what they thought, but the regular people on the streets always liked my stuff. You know, the cops, the taxi cab drivers, the, the regular people. I said, well, they relate to my stuff. And that's the <coughs> truth to this, to this day. The, the, the people, I think people in general, in downtown, love my, my sculptures. You know, the, the regular people. I don't know what you know the the, the experts think, but, but was that concrete have a, a light to it? I mean, is it going to wear away in so many years? Yeah, it, it, it can last a long time. You know, there's still concrete from the Roman days. You know, so it's it's pretty tough. And I use a, a really high quality, like architectural concrete that has it's fiber reinforced. Yeah, it's good for a while, hopefully. I ha I'd have to say that anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. and Susan, you, when you do a bronze, like you do these really large bronzes, and um, so you have to visit the foundry, and you, I mean, people don't realize, like James was saying, all the work that goes on behind the scenes, yeah. just from doing the piece, and then, can you talk a little about that process, yeah. like making a bronze out of well, yeah. like starch or clementine? Okay. Uh, it's, it's a long and long process, and it takes many trips to a foundry. And it, Bill, you went to look at several foundries in Cleveland with me yeah. last week, and, and um, I don't know where to start. <laughs> it's, 
but you're, <laughs> it, you're dealing with like people, James is his own technician and okay. like kind of that, but you're dealing with technical people, not necessarily artistic people. Right. So they're okay. looking at it in a different way than, you know, you would like it to maybe be appreciated at that stage, right? Yes. Um, what happens is um, I, can, I start with clay and then um, it has to be a mold made on top of it. Uh, and I'm made out of rubber and then a plaster mold is not on top of that. And then um, the clay is dug out and thrown away. There's no clay original ever with the bronze. It's destroyed in the process. And then there's wax poured in this rubber mold, okay? And then the wax, this is called the lost wax method. And a good art foundry uses this, okay? Not every foundry does this, um, the, um, but the ones I use have to know about this. And I have to go and see them and talk to them and t talk to the craftspeople and see if they, <coughs> they know what they're doing, see what their capabilities are. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and after the wax, the wax is dipped in li liquid ceramic, okay? Then the liquid, the, the uh, after the ceramic is dried, it's put in a kiln where the wax evaporates and that's where you get the lost wax method. So you have that empty ceramic shell that's strong enough and hard enough now to have molten bronze poured in, okay? Then after that's cooled off, then the ceramic shell is chiseled away and the bronze is um, chased or, or cleaned up and then they put the patina on it and that's when you get a bronze and that's why it's high, really expensive uh, because you have to hire a whole foundry to work on a piece, not just one person. It takes a whole team and um, say I'm doing the Roberto Clemente it weighs, that bronze weighs 2,000 pounds. So you can imagine how many people it's going to take. You, know, you have to have overhead cranes, you have to have a huge space. You can imagine how many people it takes. So that's why bronze is expensive. You know, I don't get all that money. <laughs> you know, it goes <laughs> everywhere. So it's, it's, it's different than you said that sometimes people approach you and they think that that you just pour bronze over clay. And yes, <laughs> and you can't, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, it, that'll melt the clay, it'll obliterate the clay, you know, but, um, it, you know, a lot of people don't understand the bronze casting process, and I, I didn't until I started really working with it, you know. Um, um, anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, any questions, yeah. please. Okay. Um, you, you said you go to different foundries, so is there not one foundry uh, they have the, like I said, they have different capabilities. Um, the large pieces, the large statues are done in upstate New York. Along Hudson, there's, there's about 50 foundries there. And they all have to, some of them, um, like when I do the baseball players, that's small potatoes up there. They, they do 32 foot high sculptures, you know, bronzes. It's, it's like nothing when I go up them there. Nothing when I go up there, you know. There's something here. So. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> but they they do huge, and you know, you know the the um, the, the Italian um, the, they did at da, da Vinci uh, Leonardo oh, the big da Vinci horse, horse, the horse at Italics, yeah. where I did wow. the statues, and I was there when it was getting oh, saw, cast. Where they recreated uh, one of yeah. those drawings, and they did it in bronze. I think yes. it's on like Nova or something. Right, and I was there when they were doing it, and they gave it as a gift to Milan. And that's the kind of boundary I need to for my work. Uh, in Cleveland, I do the small piece. Like I do busts of people. I take private commissions. I do. There's a small bronze I have back there, and I use people in Cleveland. They have a small capacity. And for the first